Reva Pate PG lecture series program that we have been uh, having uh, conducting on a regular basis, and uh, uh, we try and bring you a whole way, variety of topics and programs and try to keep it interesting and uh, try to bring you new speakers with new talent pools and new skill sets uh, just so we can keep it exciting and keep it, uh, in the mix. Uh, it gives me great uh, Dr. Rishmin, you're not audible. You're not audible. Okay. Yeah, it's back. Now? Yeah, it's back. It's back. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Right. So you couldn't hear anything at all about. No, 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 no. Just the last few just seconds. Last few. Yeah. All right. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, a young friend of mine, Dr. Vikas Menon. He is uh, an additional professor of psychiatry at the Jawaharlal Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research at Puducherry. He has completed his PG training uh, in 2008 from uh, JIPMER and he's acquired the Diplomat of National Board Certification 2009. He has 15 years of teaching and research experience in the field. His research work focuses on digital psychiatry, on suicidology, on neurobiology of mood disorders. He has over 170 scientific publications in various peer-reviewed journals and various book chapters. Uh, his work has won prestigious awards. Dr. Rishmin, again, we have lost your voice. Your voice. Yeah, I think the host is kind of... Yeah, you're back. ...confusing us. Yeah. Uh, he has won several prestigious uh, research excellence awards, such as the Bombay Psychiatric Society Silver Jubilee Award, the Professor K.C. Dube Award, and the Pune Psychiatrist Association Award. He is a prolific speaker, as we all will see firsthand today. He has served as the, or he is serving as the deputy editor of the Indian Journal of Psychiatry. And he is also the chief associate editor of the Indian Journal of of Psychological Medicine, that's the IJPM, right? So uh, it, it, it's quite a, a long read, and uh, clearly you are far more uh, prodigious than any of us are. So you're probably the right person for this job today with us. And uh, it's 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 great that you agreed to be with us and uh, share your knowledge and wisdom and uh, you're going to speak to us today on uh, the inflammation hypothesis of major depression 30 years of progress from bench to the clinic uh, the inflammation hypothesis is not a new one it's been around the block for a long time uh, well before my postgraduate days and uh, 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 it has been revisited multiple times and it's coming back in vogue with a lot of new developments uh, the information hypothesis has various contexts and subtexts to it. And uh, I'm sure Vikas will educate us all a little bit more about it. Uh, a few housekeeping rules, uh, which I'm sure the host may have explained, but I shall just uh, request all of you to keep yourself muted and uh, preferably keep your videos off as well, uh, because uh, it kind of tends to interfere with the flow of the topic uh, and the discourse. So uh, it would be kind of you to kindly comply with the house rules. We shall uh, be happy to take your questions uh, at the end of his talk. Uh, Vikas will be happy to answer your queries. Uh, if possible, we will try to open up the video link so we can actually see you when you ask your questions. But you would uh, definitely be able to get them addressed nonetheless through the chat box. So we encourage you to post your questions all through the discourse, and uh, we'll try and do justice to all the queries at the end of the talk. So, without any further ado, uh, I will request Dr. Vikas to please take the proceedings forward, and uh, please do have the pleasure of sharing your wisdom with us. Over to you, Vikas. Thank you so much, uh, Rishmin sir, and our entire team. Uh, it's my it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be on this platform. 
that's been uh, you know that's been shared by so many experts over the years i'm i have read about it so it's an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you so just give me a moment to share my screen sure i'm going to un i'm going to uh, mute myself and stop my video so i will follow the house rules which i recommend everybody else follows and i'll be i'll be there in the background yeah. don't you worry yeah yeah about. yeah sure sure uh yeah Okay, so I hope my screen is visible now. Okay, so uh, the topic uh, is the inflammation hypothesis of major depression: thirty years of progress from the bench to clinic. Uh, as uh, you know, Dr. Rishmin rightly said, this is not a new thing, but uh, over the years, a lot of research has happened, and a lot of new directions have come in. and we'll try and summarize uh, what has gone on in the last 30 years and how it can guide our practice so this is the overview of my presentation uh, for the next uh, roughly 1 hour or so initially we will talk about the history of the origins of inflammation in depression and how this knowledge has uh, come in and then we will proceed to the evidence base for inflammation in depression what are the various lines of evidence that contribute to our understanding of uh, inflammation and depression then we will move on to the mechanistic pathways that explain the association between inflammation and depression how inflammation actually can cause depression because that's uh, the line of understanding now that's the hierarchy in which we understand how immune alterations can lead to uh, various behavioral disorders and Uh, then i have a couple of slides on translational implications but that's really a summary of what we have discussed before because as and when there is a translational implication in what we are discussing i will discuss it then and there but i will also summarize in a few slides uh, in my fourth section and then i will move on to evidence for anti inflammatory treatments in mdd that is uh, really going to be the therapeutics part of it how we can utilize the knowledge that we have gained so far in terms of treating uh, depressed individuals and uh, how we can put it all together how we can put all the theoretical knowledge and the knowledge about the therapeutics together to guide our day to day practice with the evidence that we have today of course it's a rapidly changing field and uh, therefore with whatever available evidence we have now how we can uh, go about in our day to day practice so that's going to be the structure of the presentation uh so historical overview you know as early as the late 19th century Sir William Osler, when discussing about the condition progressive septicemia, he remarked that this condition is, uh, you know, characterized by marked mental prostration and apathy. So, in so doing, Sir William Osler was actually laying the seeds for subsequent fields of psychoneuroimmunology and immunopsychiatry. In the late 1970s and early 1980s. Uh, there were a lot of developments in this field robert adder in his pivotal book titled psychoneuroimmunology it was published in 1981 so this was uh, the book that introduced the term psychoneuroimmunology to the larger audience and this term uh, was actually introduced by him to denote the various interactions between the brain and the immune system but there was uh, as the term suggests you know the slant of understanding was that Uh, how psychiatric and behavioral disorders can influence the immune system rather than the other way around then in the mid 1980s uh, in 1985 to be precise benjamin hart coined the term sickness behavior you many of you must be familiar with this term so this term actually refers to a constellation of signs and symptoms characterized by low motivation apathy and the symptoms that resemble depression in an episode of fever or sickness so Uh, that was again another recognition of the intricate links between the brain and the immune system then subsequently over the next two decades there were a lot of uh, research in this field and two major lines of evidence drove a conceptual shift in thinking especially a hierarchical shift in the balance between the brain and the immune system so those two important lines of evidence one was preclinical evidence from animal models uh where you know if you they found that if you activate the immune system of the animals it led to a lot of behavioral manifestations that were consistent with the description of depression 
And the other one was clinical evidence where uh, interferon therapies, especially for patients with cancer or chronic viral hepatitis, uh, they triggered depression and a variety of other psychiatric adverse effects. So with these two major lines of evidence coming in from various studies, uh, with these two lines of proliferating evidence, uh, a new term called immunopsychiatry was coined. It was first used in a publication of the Biological Psychiatry uh, in the year 2014. So as you can see, both of these terms, psychoneuroimmunology and immunopsychiatry, denote a very close interaction between the brain and the immune system. But uh, the hierarchy has now shifted in terms of understanding that mainly it is immune alterations that drive uh, behavioral and psychiatric disorders rather than the other way around. So what it means is if you can develop novel treatments that target or modulate the immune systems, then you can also modify or manage psychiatric disorders. So that's going to be what we are discussing today. So before going to uh, talk about how, what are the uh, cytokine alterations that are noted in depression, we should understand that inflammatory cytokines serve a lot of normal brain functions in terms of brain development. They are very critical in terms of normal brain development. They are helpful to maintain neuronal integrity, uh, neurogenesis, it supports neurogenesis, synaptic remodeling, and a variety of other brain functions. So uh, inflammatory cytokines are essential for normal brain function. It is in this context that we should understand their contributory role in the pathobiology of major mental illness, particularly depression, which is what we're going to focus in this talk. But uh, let me tell at the outset that uh, although I'm going to focus only on the in, uh, role of inflammation and depression, uh, there has been proliferating evidence for a role for inflammation in schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, and uh, anxiety disorders, almost all uh, major and minor mental conditions. So uh, that's why I have labeled it as pathobiology of mental, major mental illness. But in this talk, we are only going to focus on depression. But we should understand this in the context that inflammatory cytokines serve a lot of normal brain function. So uh, this is a very important uh, slide, a picture for us to understand uh, the discussion that is uh, going to follow. Uh, so this is the overview of the normal inflammatory response in the body. So it starts with production of inflammatory inducers. Uh, they go by the names damage associated molecular patterns and the pathogen associated molecular patterns. You can just follow my cursor on the screen here. So whenever there is any infection, for example, or any tissue damage, it can lead to the outpouring of pathogen associated molecular patterns and uh, DAMP, damage associated molecular patterns. Once these inflammatory inducers are produced, they go and act on the sensors, on the corresponding sensors within the uh, target organs, target organ receptors. Uh, now, these sensors, they go by the names inflammasomes, toll like receptors, etc., etc. Once they bind to these sensors, what happens next? There is activation of a lot of signal transduction pathways and intracellular transcription factors that code for key inflammatory proteins, some of which are mentioned here. That is the tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin 1, and interleukin 6. Once these inflammatory mediators are produced, now they get into the bloodstream and from there they gain access to various target organs. It could be the brain, it could be liver, it could be the heart, it could be the bone. And depending on which target organ is affected, you get a variety of effects. For example, you get neuroinflammation or you get metabolic side effects or you get adverse cardiovascular outcomes or you get osteoporosis if the, brain, if the bone is affected. So uh, this slide helps us to understand uh, how the inflammatory response is, uh, what are the stages, what are the various components of the normal inflammatory response. So keep this in mind because we will be using a lot of these terms in our subsequent discussions and then you can link back to this slide uh, as we go forward. Right, so we have now seen uh, the, a brief historical overview of inflammation and depression. We have seen the components of a normal inflammatory response. Now, what is the evidence base for immunoinflammation in major depression? There are four major lines of evidence for increased or activated inflammation, inflammatory response in depression. Molecular evidence, evidence from peripheral blood studies, evidence from you know, central, central evidence of inflammation, and uh, that's from the central nervous system. And the last is uh, empirical or clinical evidence. 
So first one is the molecular level of evidence. Our research findings tell us that there is increased expression and polymorphisms of various immune related genes that code for uh, key inflammatory proteins like interleukin 1, tumor necrosis factor alpha and C reactive protein and depression. Increased activation of intracellular signal transduction pathways have been noted in depression, specifically uh, pathways that lead to production of mitogen activated protein kinase and intracellular transcription factors like nuclear factor KB. Increased Active, increased density of activated sensors. So in the previous slide, we talked about the components of a normal inflammatory response. The second component was the sensor. So in depression, increased sensors, uh, both in number as well as function have been noted. So they are the toll like receptors and the inflammasomes. And finally, increased telomere length, which is a common substrate noted in both inflammation and depression, and which tells us that uh, both are intertwined and common mechanisms may be uh, underlying both conditions. Then next is evidence from peripheral blood studies. So here what has been noted is increased levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the peripheral blood of individuals with depression and various other markers which point to inflammation like increased endothelial cell activation markers, increased levels of adipokines, increase acute phase proteins like uh, CRP, C-reactive protein, and increase levels of various oxidative stress markers, all of which, uh, you know, tell us about neuroinflammation, cellular integrity, and a lot of other things. So this is another important line of evidence for immune inflammation in depression. Some researchers ask the question, so what if there is increased peripheral inflammation? How and how robustly does it correlate with central inflammation, which is what we are really interested in, isn't it? If we are talking about neuroinflammation. So, uh, uh, you know, a lot of research has gone into markers of central markers or central indices of inflammation. So, there also they have found corroborative evidence like increased levels of pro inflammatory cytokines in the CSF, increased levels of pro inflammatory cytokines in key brain areas like frontal cortex and anterior cingulate areas, which are. Uh, key brain areas in the uh, cortical and subcortical circuits which have been found to be involved in depression and increased microglia activation. All of this points to neuroinflammation. So inflammation occurs in depression not only in the periphery but also in the center. That's the message. And finally, uh, this is perhaps the most uh, voluminous line of evidence that is uh, evidence from clinical studies where they have found increased prevalence of autoimmune diseases in patients with depression and vice versa. That is, increased prevalence of depression in autoimmune diseases. So this is something that is uh, very robustly uh, replicated over the years uh, and which tells us that both autoimmune diseases as well as depression may share common risk factors in terms of environmental events that drive baseline inflammatory state as well as maybe shared genetic risk factors. Also, increased prevalence of diseases with a pro-inflammatory status has been noted in depression, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis. So these are all conditions with a pro-inflammatory basis. And when these conditions are uh, increasingly represented in major depression compared to healthy controls, you begin to think, yes, then there may be some shared inflammatory basis for these conditions. And finally, uh, what we talked about uh, earlier also in the historical overview section, uh, patients who are administered immunotherapy with cytokines such as interferon alpha for conditions like cancer or chronic viral hepatitis has been found to develop depression, uh, even though they may not have any previous risk factor. So the depressogenic effects of immunotherapy with cytokines also tells us that there may be an inflammatory basis that's driving depression in at least a subgroup of individuals. So that's uh, the various lines of evidence for immunoinflammation and depression. Uh, now, I just want to uh, let you in on some key articles which have, uh, which have summarized the evidence for inflammation and depression. Uh, this is a very important meta-analysis that was done a decade ago. Uh, it, is, it is very uh, heavily cited. It has been cited nearly 3,500 times in the global literature. So this is something that all of us should know. Uh, a meta-analysis of cytokines in major depression. Uh, Meta-analysis is basically, for those who may not be familiar with this term, is uh, basically a quantitative summary of a lot of studies. So they took together about 24 studies 
uh, which had a cumulative number of participants of more than 1,200, so 24 individual studies, and they pooled the results and found out uh, what is the evidence for cytokines in major depression. So when you do this, the power of the studies exponentially grows when you pool in the studies because the sample size increases. So eight cytokines were analyzed in this meta-analysis. And uh, as the results show here, you know, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-6 were consistently or had a good effect size in terms of their difference between major depression and controls. The other six cytokines uh, were not uh, uh, robustly significant between cases and controls. So what it tells is two things. One is that inflammation is not an across-the-board phenomenon in major depression. You may have some cytokines which are elevated. You may have some cytokines which are perhaps uh, not very significantly altered. So that is uh, learning point number one. Learning point number two is if you are planning a study on cytokines in major depression, you need to be guided by these kind of meta-analysis, robust meta-analysis, and you need to select your cytokines carefully because if you don't select your cytokines, you may end up evaluating those cytokines that are not going to show a major difference. And then that is not really going to add to the body of literature. So uh, we actually, we were guided to a large extent in one of our studies, which, did, which we did in our center. It was a very simple cross-sectional study that we did, but we were guided by the results of this meta-analysis in choosing our cytokines. So we actually studied two pro-inflammatory markers and one anti-inflammatory marker, TNF-alpha, IL-6 were the pro-inflammatory markers that we studied. And uh, we studied the anti-inflammatory marker TGF-beta, transcription growth factor beta. And what we found was also interesting. We found significantly raised levels of TNF-alpha and IL-6, but not transcription growth factor beta. Our hypothesis was that if there is actually an inflammatory state in depression, anti-inflammatory markers should be reduced in uh, magnitude, whereas the pro-inflammatory markers should be increased. But it was not, uh, it was not a consistent uh, evidence that way. So that also tells us that, again, uh, that inflammation is not an across-the-board phenomenon. There may be certain markers which are following, uh, which are uh, elevated, certain other markers which are static, and certain other markers that may not really help us to distinguish between uh, cases of depression and control. So we really have to choose our markers that we are studying wisely. The other study that I want to present here is something uh, very interesting and uh, which has perhaps uh, very important translational implications. Association of serum interleukin-6 and C-reactive protein in childhood with depression and psychosis in young adult life. So this was a population-based longitudinal study published in the JAMA Psychiatry in the year mm -hmm. 2014. Uh, what these authors did were they measured serum IL-6 levels at nine years. And then subsequently, at the age of 18 years, that is nine years down the line, they assessed these subjects for first episode depression. The sample size was huge. It was over 4,500. And what they found was also very interesting after adjusting for confounders. So that was a very important strength of the study. Whenever you do any study on inflammatory markers in depression, you must adjust for confounds. So these, uh, these authors adjusted mainly for uh, body weight and smoking. So after adjusting for confounders, those with raised interleukin-6 at the age of nine were more likely to be depressed yes. nearly a decade later. So that's, uh, you know, now you can come to appreciate the translational implication. So you measure, uh, you measure an inflammatory marker in childhood, you can actually use that to predict first episode depression onset a decade later. So the odds ratios were 1.6. Usually odds ratios of more than 1.5 are considered clinically significant also. So odds ratios were pretty impressive. So that's, uh, uh, these kind of studies are very rare. So that's why we should be aware of this uh, study in the JAMA Psychiatry. Finally, uh, I want to tell about this meta-analysis, which has just been published actually in early this year in the Brain Behavior and Immunity, which is a very prestigious journal. Inflammatory markers and depression, a meta-analysis of uh, variability of more than 10,000 subjects, uh, cumulatively 5,000 patients and 5,000 controls. So you can see that these two meta-analyses, the Dowlety and the Osimo meta-analysis are separated by a decade. And what has gone on in a decade is that the number of studies have increased by almost uh, you know, 10 times or five times. 107 studies were included in this uh, meta-analysis. And you can also have a look here at the number of immune markers that were studied, which underwent a 40 times increase. So you need to study an array of inflammatory markers if you need to get significant findings. That's the other message. Uh, they found about six inflammatory markers 
CRP, interleukin-6, interleukin-3, 12, 18, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, which were higher in cases compared to controls. So out of 306 immune measures studied, these were the uh, only a handful of them were higher in cases and control than controls. So again, telling us that uh, we need to pay a lot of attention to selecting our markers when we do our research. Importantly, these significant findings persisted after controlling for confounding variables. So that tells us that the findings are pretty robust and driven by inflammation and not by any other confounding factor. Now, uh, this is the final study that I want to present in this section. This uh, was not a meta-analysis. This was a longitudinal study of 36 patients who were admitted for severe treatment-resistant depression. They evaluated inflammatory markers pre and post treatment. What they found was, uh, this was published last year, a pretty recent study in the Journal of Affective Disorders. They found that uh, certain markers like increased interleukin-6, in, uh, interleukin-8, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and CRP are associated with a poorer treatment response. So that again tells us an important translational implication. You can use inflammatory markers to predict treatment response. You can use it to identify a subset of individuals who may not respond so robustly to your antidepressants compared to others. At the same time, some proteins also were found to increase during treatment. So some of them decreased, some of them increased. Some of them didn't uh, uh, show the change. So what could be the translational implication of that? I just want you to reflect, the, reflect on this for a few seconds before uh, I tell the answer. What could be the possible translational implication if you treat some uh, depressed individuals and you find that some inflammatory markers increase, whereas some others do not, some others stay static? Okay, so uh, the translational significance of this could be that, uh, you know, some are probably state markers of depression, whereas some are trait markers. I don't know if you're aware of this distinction. We talk about state markers and trait markers in depression. So state markers are those which are dependent on the clinical state. That is, they fluctuate uh, in tandem with the clinical state. So when someone is depressed, those markers will show uh, a, a fluctuation. And when they are out of their depressed state, those markers will come back to their normal levels. On the other hand, when we talk about trait markers, these are uh, more enduring characteristics which are not heavily dependent on the clinical state. Something like personality traits, you know, which don't fluctuate, which stay with the individual throughout life. So you can remember like that state and trait markers. So that could be a potential translational implication there. And of course, the other one is a very exciting translational implication that is, you can use inflammatory markers to develop predictors of response uh, to drive what is called personalized care. So now it's the era of personalized medicine. Uh, so similarly, you know, we talk about how depression is a heterogeneous condition, how no two depressions are alike uh, in terms of their uh, biopsychosocial profiles. So you can use this knowledge of inflammatory markers to guide uh, personalized care for uh, people with depression. So uh, the message is, as the depression gets more severe, more chronic and treatment resistant, uh, inflammation is more and more prominently seen in such subgroup of individuals with depression. So perhaps it is in these individuals that inflammatory mechanisms are more relevant. And perhaps it is in these individuals that if you give anti-inflammatory therapeutics, it may make the largest difference. So as we go along with this presentation, you will find that this theme keeps coming in repeatedly. That is, uh, inflammation is not for everybody with depression. Inflammation is perhaps relevant to a subset of individuals with depression. And through our research and through our uh, informed clinical practice, we should be trying to identify that subgroup of depression who are perhaps having that inflammatory biotype. Okay, so now we have seen the various lines of evidence for inflammation in depression. Now we are going to see where does this inflammation come from? Okay, now there is uh, good evidence to tell us. I hope we are all sufficiently convinced now that depression has some inflammatory basis, at least in a subgroup of individuals. A lot of inflammatory markers are elevated. Uh, but where does this uh, inflammation actually come from? So this picture is... Uh, what tells you about the various sources of inflammation and depression. Uh, 
one of the key sources of inflammation is stress. So stress and chronic stress that leads to various psychiatric disorders. So when there is stress, there is gut dysbiosis and increased intestinal permeability. So a lot of the gut microbiota get translocated to the bloodstream from where it can produce what we talked in the first slide that is components of a typical inflammatory response. We talked about inflammatory inducers. So uh, they go by the names pathogen associated molecular patterns and damage associated molecular patterns. So these are the various PAMPs and DAMP compounds which are listed here. Once these are produced in sufficient amounts, they go and act on the tall like receptors, which are the sensors on the, uh, on the target organ receptors. So then that leads to outpouring of various signal transduction and pathways and everything which we discussed earlier, outpouring of uh, inflammatory cytokines and they gain access to the brain and neuroinflammation. So that's how uh, stress is a major source of inflammation. Apart from stress and chronic stress, certain lifestyle factors could be sources of inflammation like sedentary lifestyle, obesity, and poor diet, poor sleep habits, or substance abuse like mainly smoking and to a lesser extent also alcohol. So uh, if you can, so this, what does the slide also tells you? This slide also gives another message that you can utilize these clues to identify those individuals that come into that inflammatory biotype of depression. So if I am sitting in my clinic and I see an individual who is presenting with depression at the same time, he is also have following a very sedentary lifestyle. He's obese. Uh, they don't follow a balanced diet, they don't sleep, their sleep schedules are awry, and they also smoke. So, aha, now I'm thinking, okay, now here is a patient who may fit into my inflammatory biotype of depression, and I'm going to now incorporate that knowledge into my diagnostic formulation so that it will guide my management to the extent possible and driven by evidence. So that's how you can utilize uh, the knowledge of sources of inflammation. So now we have seen the various sources of inflammation. So if the inflammatory cytokines are produced in the periphery, how do they gain access to the brain? So this is the, what many researchers talked about. You know, how does uh, peripheral inflammatory markers gain access to the brain? So this is mainly by two mechanisms. So peripheral inflammation can get into the brain either through the humoral route or the neural route. The first one is the humoral route. In the humoral route, these inflammatory cytokines uh, they actually get into the brain through areas of the brain that are where the blood brain barrier is deficient, like the circumventricular organs. And there is also an active receptor uptake across uh, blood brain barrier. So these are the two important mechanisms that come into the humoral route. And the other, of course, is the neural route where uh, these cytokine receptors can bind, uh, cytokines can bind to the cytokine receptors which are expressed in peripheral. Uh, afferent fibers of the vagus nerve predominantly and uh, then they can relay signals to the key brain regions like nucleus of tractus solitarius. So through the humoral route and the neural route uh, you can uh, these cytokines, peripheral cytokines, peripherally produced cytokines gain access to the brain. Those are the two major mechanisms. There are also some minor mechanisms like interleukin-1 receptors which are expressed on the uh, endothelial cells across the brain barrier. But those are minor mechanisms. These are the two major mechanisms of how the cytokines gain access to the brain. Right. So now, uh, what all have we seen? We have seen the evidence for inflammation and depression. We have seen from where the inflammation comes from, the sources of inflammation, and how peripherally produced cytokines can gain access to the brain. So now, we are at a point of our understanding where the inflammatory cytokines have been produced. They have gained access to the brain. Now, in the brain, how do they drive inflammation? What are the mechanistic pathways that link inflammation and mental illness? Which is what we're going to see in the next uh, few slides. So this is a very important part of the presentation. So the first mechanism how uh, inflammation may drive depression is through activation of the indolamine dioxygenase pathway. The second is how inflammatory cytokines can drive uh, perturbations in metabolism, production, and transport of neurotransmitters. The third is effects on the hypothalamus pituitary. And the last is effects on trophic factors, which are essential for neuronal, neuronal integrity, like 
various neurotropic factors and the growth factors. So these are the uh, four areas where inflammation can drive uh, depression or trigger conditions which are sufficient for the development of clinical depression. The first one that I'm going to talk about is effect of inflammation on the indolamine dioxygenase pathway. So you can have a look at this figure here. I'll try and explain this to you. So we all know that tryptophan is an essential amino acid that we get through the diet. Normally, there are two pathways of degradation of tryptophan. One is the kynurenin pathway and the other is the uh, you know, the other uh, portion of the tryptophan which doesn't go into the kynurenin pathway is what serves as the precursor for the, uh, for the synthesis of serotonin. Uh, so that's uh, the normal pathway. Normally, out of the, uh, whatever tryptophan you consume, 95% goes into the kynurenin pathway and about 5% or so uh, goes into production of serotonin, which is sufficient in the normal course of things to maintain the mood balance. But in the presence of systemic inflammation, when you have these inflammatory cytokines which are working their effect, what happens is there is activation of indolamine dioxygenase pathway. Now, this is predominantly an extrahepatic pathway. So what happens is a lot of the dietary tryptophan now gets converted to kynurenin. So a lot of tryptophan gets diverted to the dynurenin pathway because this IDO pathway is now working over time. So that leaves very little tryptophan for conversion to serotonin. So that's uh, one way how uh, this mechanism can be counterproductive in, uh, to the mood. But when more of tryptophan gets diverted to kynurenin, there is an inherent danger there. You can see a lot of the catabolic products of kynurenin here. And particularly, I want you to focus on this compound that is quinolinic acid. Uh, now, this is not a very good molecule because it can lead to activation of the NMDA receptor, which is actually a glutamatergic receptor. And once there is unfettered stimulation of the NMDA receptor, you can get excitotoxicity. You all know that. So excitotoxicity, and uh, that's bad news for neuronal integrity. So a lot of neuronal damage and all occurs. There's also another uh, breakdown product of kynurenin, catabolic product called kynurenic acid. Uh, the relevance of which we'll be discussing in a few slides down the line. So here I mainly want you to focus on how less amount of tryptophan is now available for conversion to serotonin and how increased uh, diversion of tryptophan to the kynurenin pathway can produce toxic compounds like quinolinic acid, which is not good for neuronal integrity. So that's two mechanisms here, uh, we have learned here how inflammation can uh, predispose to depression or inflammation can drive depression. Of course, there are a lot of other ways in which inflammation can be uh, harmful to the serotonin balance. Inflammation by itself can increase the expression and activity of the neuronal serotonin transporter. And you all know the function of the neuronal serotonin transporter is to uh, take back serotonin from the synapse. So that leaves very little serotonin in the synapse to drive the postsynaptic receptor. Post receptor. Post receptor. Post receptor. Post receptor. Oh, there was some echo. Okay. Uh, yeah. So at the same time, inflammation can also induce activation of P38 mitogen activated protein kinase. We briefly discussed about this earlier. These are signal transduction pathways, which is what results in increased expression and activity of the neuronal transporter. But at the same time, you know, uh, not everybody who, for example, not everybody who's administered cytokines develop uh, depression. Not everybody who gets cytokine therapy develops depression. So there is also an interaction with genetic vulnerability. Particularly, it has been found that those who carry the short allele of the serotonin transporter linked promoter gene, uh, they are more vulnerable to these uh, inflammatory uh, effects, inflammatory mechanisms. So uh, it's a combination, again, of... Uh, uh, factors that uh, you know determine genetic vulnerability together with a pro-inflammatory state. So when these two factors interact, then that leads to uh, actual effects on the serotonin levels and trigger conditions that are necessary for the development of depression. Okay, now we move on from serotonin to dopamine. Uh, inflammation can also uh, have a lot of deleterious consequences on the dopamine uh, synthesis and neurotransmission. Just look at the right hand side of this picture here. This is uh, showing the normal dopamine synthesis pathway. So uh, phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine to L-dopa and dopamine. The rate limiting step in 
dopamine synthesis is this one, that is conversion of tyrosine to L-dopa by tyrosine hydroxylase. Now, this molecule here is called tetrahydrobiopterin, and this molecule is an important cofactor for this enzyme that is the rate limiting step in the synthesis of dopamine. Now, normally, uh, enough tetrahydrobiopterin is obviously available, but in the presence of inflammatory uh, cytokines, uh, what you have is you have obviously uh, an activation of GTP cyclohydrolase 1, which actually increases the production of tetrahydrobiopterin. So this is beneficial, but the other two effects which I'm going to talk about here, this is what I want you to focus on. This deleterious effects largely offset this beneficial effect due to uh, you know, stimulation of cyclohydrolase enzyme. The deleterious effects are inflammatory cytokines can increase the production of free radicals, that is reactive oxygen species, and also induce nitric oxide uh, by nitric oxide uncoupling. It can lead to the production of various oxygen and nitrogen-based free radicals. Now, increased amount of free radicals is not good news as far as tetrahydrobiopterin is concerned because it's a very redox-sensitive compound. So in the presence of these free radicals, tetrahydrobiopterin gets oxidized to its redox products, leaving very little of this molecule now available to act as a cofactor for the rate-limiting step in the synthesis of dopamine. So that means that dopamine synthesis is impaired. That's the message. Plain and simple, inflammatory cytokines, when they are uh, produced in increasing amounts, they decrease dopamine synthesis. This is just the uh, mechanism by which it does that. So if you want to just remember one message from this slide, just remember that when there is increased inflammation in the body, there is decreased dopamine synthesis. Uh, next, oops, my slide has got stuck. I think I have to stop sharing and then go back. Okay, we are back. So uh, that's how inflammation can affect dopamine synthesis. The next effect is on inflammation on dopamine packaging and reuptake. So inflammation can also negatively affect the expression and function of vesicular monoamine transporter. So the vesicular monoamine transporter, what it does is, uh, it is actually the enzyme or the transporter that's responsible for packaging dopamine and putting it into the synaptic vesicles from where they are eventually released into the synapse. So effectively what it means is when there is uh, less uh, functioning of the VMAT2, there is again less dopamine available for synaptic neurotransmission. And finally, there's also preclinical evidence for increased dopamine uh, function, increased dopamine transporter function and expression. So we know that these monoamine transporters are what uh, reuptake, are involved in reuptake of the neurotransmitters that are released into the synapse. So, all this, what it means is there is less of dopamine now available for neurotransmission. That's pretty consistent with the monoamine theory of depression. There's also another uh, uh, closely linked mechanism to glutamate. So we talked in the earlier slide about how inflammation can drive uh, increased diversion of tryptophan to the kynurenin pathway and increased production of kynurenic acid. I promised you that in that slide that we'll talk about the consequences of increased kynurenic acid a little later. So this is the time for that. When increased kynurenic acid, which is a breakdown product of kynurenin is produced, it reduces glutamatergic transmission because kynurenic acid antagonizes the NMDA receptor. And how this affects dopamine release is a lot of dopamine release in the brain, particularly in key brain areas like the striatum, are under glutamatergic control. So if you decrease glutamatergic transmission, it also leads to decreased dopamine release in the brain. So that's the mechanism here. So this uh, picture summarizes whatever we have been talking so far about the effects of inflammation on dopamine synthesis, packaging, reuptake, and metabolism. So tryptophan and kynurin, they get into the brain uh, through the blood-brain barrier. They can activate the uh, microglia in the brain to produce more of peripheral and uh, central cytokines. The kynurenic acid breakdown product, quinolinic acid is uh, neurotoxic, it leads to the production of uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species, which are free radicals, in the presence of which tetrahydrobiopterin gets oxidized, leaving very little tetrahydrobiopterin for 
uh, to act as a cofactor for tyrosine hydroxylase in the dopamine synthesis pathway. At the same time, uh, these cytokines which are produced peripherally can directly uh, uh, you know, increase dopamine transporter expression and function and also reduce VMAT2 expression and function. And the net effect is there is less amount of dopamine now available in the synapse. Finally, we also talked about how kynurenin and the breakdown product kynurenic acid can decrease glutamatergic transmission and how then glutamate mediated dopamine releases also uh, decreased. So again, leading to decreased dopamine availability. So that's the summary of uh, effective inflammation on dopaminergic transmission. Uh, finally, we move on to glutamate. So we have discussed about inflammation on serotonin, inflammation effects on dopamine, and now inflammation effects on glutamate. So what it does, uh, what inflammation does to the glutamatergic neurotransmission, we have seen a lot of it already. Uh, because all these neurotransmitters are actually pretty intertwined. So increased production of quinolinic acid, which directly activates NMDA receptor to induce release of glutamate, which produces excitotoxicity and bad news for neuronal integrity. At the same time, decreased astro astrocytic expression of uh, glutamatergic neurotransporters. Uh, yeah, in the presence of inflammation, there is decreased expression of these glutamatergic transporters. So when there is Decreased expression, that means that the glutamate stays for a longer time in the synapse, allowing glutamate to work its toxic effects. At the same time, when there is increased release of glutamate, it has preferential action on the extrasynaptic NMDA receptors, which uh, actually leads to decreased production of trophic factors like the brain-derived neurotropic factor, uh, which is again not good for neuron neurogenesis and uh, neuronal integrity. So these are all various uh, effects uh, on in, of inflammation on various neurotransmitters. Now we move on to the effects on HPA axis, how inflammation can impact HPA axis. So here, okay. So here inflammation, uh, this picture tells you how and uh, how inflammation is impacting the HPA axis. So we talked earlier briefly about how stress can contribute to gut dysbiosis and intestinal permeability. Uh, it can lead to outpouring of uh, inflammatory cytokines through various uh, inflammatory inducers and sensors. When these in, uh, inflammatory cytokines are poured out into the bloodstream, a lot of other compounds are also poured out and key among them, important among them are the stem cells, progenitor cells and the immune cells. Now these, if they get into the brain, they can directly activate the HP axis. This actually is actually showing the neural route. We talked about how inflammatory cytokines can signal the brain by binding to uh, cytokine receptors on the vagal nerve efferents. Now, once HP axis is activated, there is also a reciprocal loop which can lead to further HP axis activation. Once HP axis is activated, you know that a lot of CRH, ACTH and all are produced, which acts on the adrenal glands and increase production of cortisol. Now, cortisol by itself can actually further impair gut dysbiosis and intestinal permeability. So there is a double whammy there. Not only gut dysbiosis, intestinal permeability can activate HP axis. At the same time, activation of HP axis can increase intestinal permeability, leading to further outpouring of inflammatory mediators and further activation of the HPA axis. Okay, now when there is increased outpouring of cortisol due to HP axis, there is also another reciprocal loop there. Now, normally, on, now this picture on the left-hand side actually tells you what happens normally. So during the normal course of things, when there is uh, acute stress, increased glucocorticoid receptor sensitivity, the released cortisol binds to the glucocorticoid receptors that translocates intracellularly. It inhibits some of these pro-inflammatory transcription factors which encode for inflammatory proteins. So that's how normally when the HP axis is activated, that's an adaptive response. It helps to keep the inflammation under control by controlling the release of these inflammatory mediators. But now, as the stress, on the right-hand side, you can see what happens as the stress becomes more chronic. So as, there is, uh, as the stress becomes more chronic, you can see now that the number of glucocorticoid receptors have reduced compared to the left-hand side of the picture. So that means there is some kind of down regulation of the glucocorticoid receptor that happens in chronic stress. So that's not good because now 
less effects, less inhibition of these, uh, you know, intracellular transcription factors that encode for these inflammatory mediators. So now these are working over time. So now you have more of inflammatory mediators which are poured out into the bloodstream. And uh, then that drives a lot of systemic inflammation. At the same time, when there is decreased expression and function of these glucocorticoid receptors, the negative feedback loop to the brain in terms of uh, regulating production of CRH, ACTH is also reduced. So the brain doesn't get the negative feedback loop. So it continues to, uh, the HP axis continues to release more and more CRH, ACTH. So that again is a double whammy as far as inflammation is concerned. So uh, more production of inflammatory markers, less inhibitory feedback loop, which drives further inflammation. So that's the effect of inflammation on the HP axis. Basically, there is uh, increased activation of the HP axis in a more chronic and enduring fashion. Finally, in this section, we are going to talk about effects on neuropeptides and growth factors. That is, increased glucocorticoid exposure can lead to decline in BDNF expression in key brain regions like hippocampal and cortical regions. And uh, in the presence of inflammation, the BDNF receptor also, uh, the expression and functioning is also reduced because they can go for phosphorylation, which further interferes with BDNF signaling. So trophic factor production, genesis, signaling, functioning, all are uh, deleteriously influenced by increased systemic inflammation. So that's the message from this uh, slide. So this picture summarizes whatever we have discussed in terms of the mechanistic links between inflammation and depression. Uh, don't get worried looking at this uh, complex picture. I'm going to try and simplify this for you. The uh, various inflammatory markers which are produced in the periphery, we talked about how through the humoral and neural route, they can, uh, through the humoral route is what is shown here, they can cross the blood-brain barrier, and get into the brain, drive a lot of uh, intracellular transcription factors, signal transduction pathways, which lead to the production of various uh, free radicals, toxic free radicals like reactive oxygen species and nitrogen species, which code for, uh, uh, which, you know, which drive the oxidation of tetrahydrobiopterin which is a key cofactor for synthesis of dopamine. So there's decreased monoamine synthesis. At the same time, inflammatory cytokines, which are produced by activation of these macrophages and astrocytes can directly activate the serotonin and dopamine transporter. At, at the same time, inhibit vesicular monoamine transporter. The net effect of all of this is, again, less of uh, monoamine neurotransmitters in the synapse. Inflammatory cytokines can also negatively drive BDNF production signaling, expression, and function. And so that completes the right-hand side of the picture. On the left-hand side, you can see how inflammatory cytokines uh, can divert more of tryptophan to the kynurenin pathway and how increased production of kynurenin can lead to production of toxic compounds like quinolinic acid. The quinolinic acid is, uh, stimulates the NMDA receptor, which, uh, you know, the uncontrolled activation of which can lead to excitotoxicity. Uh, and also quinolinic acid can inhibit the extracellular amine transporter, uh, which is responsible for taking back glutamine from the synapse, which doesn't happen because it's inhibited. And therefore, there's now more of glutamine in the synapse, which again uh, increases the excitotoxicity. So this uh, picture actually summarizes uh, all that we need to know in terms of the mechanistic pathways that drive uh, inflammation and depression. Right, so now we will move on to translational implications. So uh, what are the translational implications of what we have discussed so far? I'll just quickly summarize. We have discussed a lot of these things earlier also. I'll just put it and then maybe uh, give a few seconds for all of you to think. The research finding is that there is increased levels of inflammatory markers in treatment-resistant depression compared to non-treatment-resistant depression or healthy control. So uh, what is the translational implication of that? The translational implication is we can use inflammatory markers to identify a potentially treatment resistant subgroup of depressed individuals. So you can actually use that to predict treatment response. We discussed earlier that some of the inflammatory markers decrease with antidepressant treatment, whereas others do not. And we also discussed the translation implication of that, which is that they can be used as markers of treatment prognosis. 
then there are research findings that show us that tell us that machine learning algorithm approaches using longitudinal data either derived from uh, proper follow up studies or using electronic medical records data have shown a predictive relationship between increased inflammation and lifetime major depressive disorder so what that tells us is uh, that specific inflammatory markers can be used to predict first episode major depression a few years down the line we talked about one pro, uh, longitudinal study which predicted depression 9 years down the line isn't it so that is uh, one of the important implications finally interferon gamma induced protein 10 has distinguished dysthymic disorder from depression and healthy controls in some studies that is some of these inflammatory markers can be used to identify certain uh, certain spectrum conditions of depression like in this case dysthymia so what it means is there may be uh, just like you know we all know that depression is a heterogeneous condition so depression and depression spectrum conditions may have specific immune signatures that we can identify provided we uh, plan our research uh, you know adequately this uh, slide i just put it here this uh, as a translational implication uh, this is taken again from meta analysis in the molecular psychiatry in 2016 what the authors did was they analyzed a range of inflammatory markers in various uh, major psychiatric disorders the like uh, major depression schizophrenia schizophrenia both first episode as well as relapse and bipolar mania so you can see that most of the major mental disorders were covered uh, the patterns what this uh, slide tells us is the patterns of activation of inflammatory cytokines differ between the major mental illnesses so certain markers like interferon gamma were maximally elevated in uh, major depression whereas some others you know like interleukin 8 showed uh, maximum variation in relapse of schizophrenia so what it also tells us that the, each of these major psychiatric conditions may have different immune signatures which we can try and identify some more translational implications uh, this is a very important study that was published in the american journal of psychiatry so Uh, these kind of studies are very few where inflammatory markers have been used to guide treatment selection so in this study they found that higher crp levels were associated with a better response to nortriptyline compared to escitalopram so what that means is inflammatory biomarkers can be used to guide treatment response in major depression mm. at the same time infliximab which is actually a monoclonal antibody against tumor necrosis factor alpha uh, trials with infliximab have alleviated depression symptoms in treatment resistant depression compared to placebo but the effect was robust only in those with higher levels of inflammation so uh, only in those individuals who were stratified by a more severe variety of inflammation characterized by high crp levels probably more than 5 so what that means is that in anti inflammatory agents especially like infliximab and as we proceed you know we'll find out that it's true for most anti inflammatory agent trials that is their effects are much more pronounced in individuals who have an inflammatory subtype of uh, depression so when we do trials of anti inflammatory agents when each of us are planning some trials we need to enrich our sample for this inflammatory subtype of depression if you don't do that if you just select any and all depressions into your trial it means that you are jeopardizing your chances of finding a significant difference between groups finally whichever inflammatory marker you study or a combination of inflammatory markers you study research tells us that the effect sizes are typically very small not uh, very huge so in terms of differences between inflammation between cases and controls or in terms of effects of treatment so what that tells us is that uh you know most of these effects of inflammatory markers are not likely to be too clinically significant or more interestingly it may be that immune disequilibrium occurs in a minority of uh, individuals with depression so that's the current consensus that inflammation is not for everybody with depression not for everybody with depression but for probably less than one third of individuals and that's those that is the subgroup that we must try to identify in our practice so coming to the uh, final segment that is uh, anti inflammatory therapeutic treatments for depression how we can utilize the knowledge that we have gained so far and what uh, investigators have done to drive uh, the knowledge of anti inflammatory therapeutics for depression 
the first question that we need to ask ourselves is why do we need new treatments for mental illness particularly depression aren't we satisfied with the kind of treatments we have isn't it working adequately then why do we need new treatments see the answer is very simple yes depression antidepressant treatments do work for a good pop proportion of people with depression but uh, evidence from you know large scale real world trials like the study trial or evidence from our own clinical practice also tells us that there are some patients who do not respond you know you have to keep trying various trials of antidepressants first trial second trial third trial even then they don't respond adequately so why do they not respond in those patients we do need some augmentation or add on strategies or something else which we need to look at so the high rates of treatment resistance across disorders and even among those who respond you know a significant proportion of depression people are left with some residual symptoms that do not respond so well they respond about 60% 70% and then they continue to be at that level of an incomplete response or partial remission for years together and the daily life impact of those residual symptoms are quite significant in the terms that uh, they actually impair functioning they don't allow individuals to work at full capacity so it leads to all around dissatisfaction in terms of uh, uh, you know what they derive uh, with treatment and all said and done we still have a relatively limited psychopharmacologic repertoire of agents which we can use to to uh, augment our antidepressant uh, response uh, so that's why we need to expand our therapeutic armamentarium and look at new agents uh, and perhaps inflammatory anti inflammatory agents could be uh, there on the horizon but you know right at the beginning the first slide what i showed was that inflammatory cytokines are essential for normal brain functions you may remember that i we discussed it in the beginning so uh, the guiding principle of medical practice is always primum non nocere that is you don't do harm even if you are not able to do good to the patient the first you don't harm the patient by indiscriminately giving anti inflammatory agents to all and sundry so you don't want to do that you want to carefully select your patients in whom anti inflammatory treatments may have relevance so that's the message we don't we should not indiscriminately start anti inflammatory treatments based on whatever we have discussed so far so that's going to be the focus for my next 10 minutes or so before i wind up on how, about how we can utilize evidence to guide our day to day practice so uh, there are two meta analyses here that i want to show you Uh, both of these are very recent published within the last one year that's why it's uh, likely to be updated and uh, likely to guide our knowledge in this area the first one was a chinese meta analysis of safety and efficacy of anti inflammatory agents in the treatment of major depression so this was a pooled analysis of 26 randomized controlled trials uh, cumulatively more than 1600 participants they evaluated six anti inflammatory agents as is listed here uh and sides omega 3 fatty acids statins minocycline modafinil and nsl cysteine so this was the forest plot which summarized the main findings of the study uh, don't get uh, worried or perturbed if you are not able to follow this uh, dense slide just focus on this black diamond here so this is the summary effect of all the anti inflammatory agents when used as monotherapy so there are trials which have used anti inflammatory agents as monotherapy the effect size that is the sum, summary effect size is 0.30 now this is actually a low effect size so but it is statistically significant because this is the line of no effect in a meta analysis the central line and if your summary effect is not touching uh, or not uh, you know not uh spanning the line of no effect on the other direction then the effect is statistically significant but it's a modest effect size that's what it tells us 0.3 is not really very impressive effect size but now you see when it comes to evidence for adjunctive anti inflammatory treatments that is when the same anti inflammatory treatments are now used as add on therapies aha now the effect is really interesting you can see that now the black diamond has come farther away farther to the left of the line of no effect so that means that the effect is more robust and sure enough now you see the effect size is increased it's 0.7 now which was 0.3 earlier so this is uh, a moderate effect size so that means that uh, anti inflammatory agents in this meta analysis 
uh, when it was pooled everything together, it had a moderate effect size, which was statistically significant. Uh, mainly there were subgroup analysis. When they did subgroup analysis, we discussed that they initially tried out six uh, groups of anti-inflammatory agents. Out of that, they uh, you know, did a subgroup analysis of each of these. Uh, the number of trials obviously would differ for each of these agents. For four of these agents, NSAIDs, minocyclins, statins, and omega-3 fatty acids, the subgroup analysis showed significant antidepressant effects. In terms of side effects, uh, we, our, our evidence was not that good because only a few trials reported side effects of these agents, but that's something that we have to keep in mind because uh, many of these agents come with their own side effects. Uh, only gastrointestinal adverse, uh, adverse events were different between groups. And that too, it was only significant for statins and then acetylcysteine, not for NSAIDs, where we would expect gastrointestinal adverse effects. So in this meta-analysis, they did not find gastrointestinal adverse effects to be different between groups for NSAIDs. Now, uh, let me also tell you that maximum number of trials are with NSAIDs, especially the selective COX-2 inhibitors like the selecoxib. Uh, with other agents, uh, number of trials are not so numerous. Now, the next meta-analysis which I want to uh, tell all of you is this one, that is efficacy of anti-inflammatory treatment on major depressive disorder or depressive symptoms. Uh, this was published in the ACTA Psychiatrica Scandinavica in the year 2019. This was a larger meta-analysis, which had 36 RCTs and nearly 9,000 patients, pooled patients. So, uh, it had these uh, agents where what was evaluated and say it's cytokine inhibitors, statins, minocycline, pioglitazone, and glucocorticoids. Let's see that the number of trials with each are what is put in bracket. And the bolded ones here are the ones where the subgroup effects were significant. So that means uh, NSAID, cytokine inhibitors, statins, minocycline, and glucocorticoids showed significant uh, effects in the subgroup analysis, but not pioglitazone. Who, again, very similar to the Chinese meta-analysis, this one also showed stronger effect size for when these uh, uh, anti-inflammatory treatments were used as add-on therapies, the effect size was 0.64, uh, much higher than 0.41. Uh, now, to you, 0.41 and 0.64 in terms of raw numbers may not look very different to you, but when you when we're talking in terms of the standardized mean difference, which is what is the effect size used in the meta-analysis, it's a huge difference actually in terms of a 0.4. And effect size of 0.64 is very good. For reference, let me tell you, that the effect size of SSRIs for depression, you know, which we are all uh, programmed to think that, uh, you know, it's very effective, isn't it? That's our first line treatment. The effect size of uh, SSRIs for depression is point is in the range of 0.5. So that tells you that an effect size of 0.64 is very impressive compared to, uh, you know, other standard therapies. Importantly, also, there was no significantly increased risk for GI or CVS events. So anti-inflammatory agents were found to be pretty safe in this meta-analysis. And uh, there was a non-significant increased risk of infection. So that's another important side effect, especially when you use cytokine inhibitors. You know, you impair the immunity of the individual. That's another reason why you should not use it indiscriminately. But in this meta-analysis, they did not find increased risk of infections. Now, these two slides, I just want you to focus on the right-hand part of this table. In most of the trials which have studied celecoxib and NSAIDs, patients with higher initial inflammation experience greater benefit than those with lower inflammation. So this tells us that uh, we should carefully pre-select patients who may, be the tar who may be the right candidates for treatment with these agents, and those patients should be demonstrating higher baseline indices of inflammation. Uh, same with cytokine inhibitors, where the consistent finding in research has been that patients with high baseline CRP levels had substantially greater reduction in depressive symptoms uh, when administered add-on cytokine inhibitors compared to those with low CRP levels. So that's the message. Uh, now quickly, uh, one slide each on some of the other uh, uh, augmenting agents, anti-inflammatory agents which have been used to augment uh, primary agents for depression. Uh, prebiotics and probiotics, there are two meta-analyses on these agents, 10 trials. Uh, one was meta-analysis of 10 trials on probiotics. The effect size was not uh, significant. And there was one meta-analysis of 34 trials on prebiotics and probiotics combined. Uh, 
where also the effect size was not uh, really something to write home about. Uh, but again, in these trials, they noticed a trend for larger effect I size for clinical and medical samples. So what that means is, as the depression was uh, clinically diagnosed compared to subclinical depressions or uh, you know subthreshold presentations of depression, compared to these groups, depressions showed a larger effect size. Again, telling us that inflammatory agents may work only for those individuals who are sufficiently depressed and for those who have that inflammatory biotype of depression. Diet and depression. So does diet have anti-inflammatory effects? Yes, diet also has some anti-inflammatory effects. It has been shown in various systematic reviews. The most recent one was published in Neurology, Psychiatry and Brain Research in the year 2019. Uh, in this, they specifically evaluated a diet called Mediterranean diet. Now, if you read more about diet and depression, you'll find that there is a particular type of diet called Mediterranean diet uh, which has its own components. Uh, we cannot discuss that in the scope of this lecture here today. So this uh, systematic review actually reviewed six RCTs. The direction of effects were a little bit uh, variable, uh, but three of them found fewer recurrences of depression when individuals adhered to the Mediterranean diet. Two found higher production of BDNF levels. So the Mediterranean diet actually had a protective effect on neurons by increasing the production of these uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor and other neuroprotective uh, compounds. Uh, this stud these studies actually, which produced more of, uh, you know, which found increased production of BDNF actually encouraged their participants to take more of nuts along with the Mediterranean diet. So it is more of a hybrid Mediterranean diet where they also added some of their components. And that's precisely also uh, one of the factors that prevents us from drawing any clear conclusions about this diet because there was wide variability in dietary components across these RCTs. But perhaps this is one thing which you can advise to your patients with depression because all said and done, you know, it's not going to have too many side effects. After all, it's only a dietary intervention. But we have to seriously think about the applicability of these dietary interventions, especially the Mediterranean diet, how applicable it is to Indian culture. Because uh, when you read about this, you'll understand that it's, an, it's the cooking medium that is used in Mediterranean diet is olive oil, uh, which is not a very common thing that's used in Indian culture in, in any of the regions of India. So uh, that may be something that we, we need to think about how we can uh, translate that uh, into the Indian culture. <coughs> of course, one of the disadvantages of any dietary uh, based intervention that you advise to your patients is in terms of motivation. So the patient should be sufficiently motivated enough, you know, to follow uh, the dietary advice day in and day out. So that's something that's, uh, you know, a double-edged sword. Exercise. So yes, exercise has a lot of proven anti-inflammatory uh, benefits. Uh, various uh, trials, there's a huge body of evidence showing anti-inflammatory effects of exercise. Uh, in depression, there was one systematic review in, uh, in the year 2016 published in the Journal of Affective Disorders. This was a systematic review of 23 RCTs. The effect size when compared to no intervention was fairly robust, but not so impressive when compared to other standard treatments. When it was used as an adjunct to antidepressants, I think which is what we are more interested in because we are never going to actually advise exercise as a standalone therapy probably for depression. Mostly we're going to use that as an intelligent combo pack along with our antidepressants. So there the effect size was 0 0.5 and uh, that's, a, that's a moderate effect size, but it was just trending towards significance. It was not statistically significant. So. Uh, best probably exercise is used as an adjunct to antidepressants. And there are a lot of practical advantages and disadvantages of advising exercise to your patients. You know, uh, First, I'll talk about the advantages. It's, uh, it's not a very costly intervention. Anyone can do exercise and it doesn't carry too many side effects in the large majority of people, except maybe in those people who have degenerative disease of the joints, in which uh, cases you should be careful before you prescribe exercise. But uh, the disadvantages obviously are, you know, for example, I think all of us will agree that in our clinical day-to-day -day practice, whenever we advise exercise to our patients, especially I have found that Indian patients don't take very kindly to advice about exercise uh, or the compliance aspect is doubtful. So that's something that you have to keep in mind. Finally, no slide, no presentation on anti-inflammatory treatments for depression is complete without a slide on yoga especially in the Indian context. So integrative medicine interventions like yoga, breathing, and meditation, they also have anti-inflammatory effects, which have been shown in various trials. So these 
it's well known that yoga can modulate the stress immune response but again in trials while a positive effect size has been noted when compared to placebo when compared to standard interventions the effect sizes were more modest and uh, really the available trials uh, the evidence is discordant for or in various directions some have shown effects some have not shown good effects so we still need more research on yoga as an add on to antidepressant medication there was one systematic review on yoga and depression in the year 2017 so limited number of rcts with lot of variability in results and risk of bias was unclear in in this uh, systematic review for most of the included rcts so that really limits uh, our uh, you know our take home message from this systematic review uh, yes uh, so we are done with the pharmacotherapies but uh, we also need to remember that cognitive behavior therapies or other psychosocial therapies can also have potential anti inflammatory effects and especially you know you can use cbt to drive uh, improvements in a lot of contributory factors to inflammation so if you remember our slide on sources of inflammation uh, we talked about how dietary and lifestyle factors like sedentary lifestyle obesity smoking diet patterns so cognitive behavior therapy you can eminently use to address a lot of these substance use behaviors Uh, to drive improvements in uh, exercise and physical activity so cbt can actually address a multiple contributors leading to inflammation and perhaps also have more durable effects if you can uh, get them to adhere to your recommendations uh, there was one systematic review of cbt as an anti inflammatory uh, therapy in major depression this was in the australian new zealand journal of psychiatry in the year 2019 there were a total of 23 trials that uh, were included in the systematic review and uh, of course the effects were mixed indicating that we need more research in this area 14 studies out of 23 showed a reduction in at least one inflammatory marker in depression uh, but on the other hand three studies showed an increase in the inflammatory markers and no change in inflammatory markers were noted in six studies so put together i think we need more research in this area but uh, poor treatment response were found in those with higher pre morbid inflammation so that again tells you how higher pre morbid inflammation may be a predictor of treatment response to your conventional antidepressant therapies be it pharmacotherapy or psychosocial therapies yeah so we got some evidence for inflammation and depression but there are plenty of unanswered questions in this areas which uh, many of you perhaps can think about researching in the future so i'm just going to present a few of them here the first one is we don't really know if changes in cytokine levels parallel treatment response in depression so we know that uh, you know um, anti inflammatory agents perhaps may improve with treatment of depression but does the change in cytokine levels correlate with improvements in depression so that's what we are really interested so in fact a meta analysis uh, in the year 2011 tried to examine this question they did not find positive evidence that the changes in cytokine levels are uh, you know exactly correlating with changes in treatment depression we did a small six week prospective study in our center and uh, it was published in the year 2015 or 16 so that actually uh, what we did was we gave fluoxetine to patients with depression and then followed up their cytokine levels over six weeks and tried to see if cytokine levels can uh, distinguish responders from non responders but no we didn't get uh, uh, a robust response there but that is not our primary outcome therefore we do not know if the sample size was adequately powered to detect it so that's perhaps a question for all of you to look into later at the same time now we we if we start an anti inflammatory treatment for depression we don't know how long to give that's another unanswered question do we give it for 3 months 6 months 1 year 2 year do we continue indefinitely we don't know answers to that uh, we also don't know if certain specific symptoms may predict better response to anti inflammatory treatment so that is something that has been shown for example in depression uh inflammation has been linked to certain key cortical and subcortical circuits especially reward circuits in the basal ganglia so these tend to correlate with symptoms like anhedonia and apathy so can we use this neurobiological knowledge to drive our anti inflammatory therapeutics no study so far in literature has used this conceptual framework to design better trials so that's something that's again unanswered finally how do we identify subgroups are there some markers which we can use some inflammatory biomarkers which we can use to tell us that perhaps here is a depression patient in front of me who might benefit from add on inflammatory therapies 
uh, we don't know as of now we don't have robust evidence for this question either so we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of evidence we have a lot of unanswered questions the last part of my talk is how we are going to actually use or integrate whatever we have discussed so far into practice before i go i before i go further i must tell you that the evidence for inflammation and depression as far as practice recommendations are concerned is not going to be very strong because uh, the evidence is still accumulating we need to do more research we need to accumulate our evidence before we can make any definitive recommendations so what i'm going to tell you now is a preliminary approach which we can perhaps use in our practice which is safe which is not going to have too many side effects and what is also guided by the limited evidence that we have so that's what i'm going to focus upon so we have to whenever a patient comes to us with depression the first thing to do is to obtain a detailed history that's what we all do isn't it so yes but when we do that also include inflammatory antecedents into your history make a separate section for it probably in your uh, if you if you don't want to do it in your hopi make a separate section for it somewhere uh, after your hopi so there you should look at factors like the various sources of inflammation that we talked about like obesity sedentary lifestyle early life adversity now this is a very important factor that has been found to uh, be linked to uh, increased inflammatory indices increased hp axis activation and subsequent enhanced or exaggerated inflammatory responses to uh, stressors so that's something that you should look for early life adversity then smoking then family history of immune disorders maybe gluten sensitivity or conditions with an inflammatory basis like medical disorders such as inflammatory bowel disease they're so going to look for all of these when you take a history uh, of patient with depression because you now you are going to if any of these are there you're going to be primed that okay here is a history which might point to uh, an underlying inflammation in the patient in front of me at the same time also look for uh, symptoms of certain uh, you know nutrients in the body like omega 3 fatty acids vitamin c vitamin e and folic acid all of these have anti inflammatory antioxidant properties so symptoms that you could look for are frequent infections skin and mucosal disorders uh, uh some things like fatigue uh, mood shifts sudden unexplained mood shifts so these are all perhaps some symptoms that you could look for in terms of nutrient deficiencies once you do that once you get all this information incorporate that also into your uh, diagnostic formulation so that uh, you are guided uh, for your future practice then always start off by advising low cost non pharmacological interventions like some of the dietary and, and exercise recommendations that we talked about and also look specifically for any substance use and try to manage that especially comorbid smoking or alcohol because these are potential drivers of inflammation so that might compromise your response to antidepressants that you see now then you go ahead and give your standard therapies you go and give your antidepressants if after one or two trials of antidepressants if you are not finding a good response maybe what you can do with the current evidence is you can send for an inflammatory marker estimation and here you have to keep in mind that uh, the cost factor the availability factor so ticking ticking most of the boxes here is this compound called c reactive protein you know because it's fairly cheap it's easily available even in a phc you can do a crp uh, even uh, and it doesn't have too much of variability across laboratories the reference standards are almost the same so it's not likely to vary too much between whichever laboratory does it uh and at the same time it doesn't depend on the time of the day that you extract a most a lot of these things especially hp axis markers you need to uh you know the uh, levels would depend on the time of the day when you draw the sample but crp doesn't have that property so whichever time you draw it it's going to show uh, a, a fairly uh, you know correct value so you could think about estimating crp in your patients and then once you determine all this that there is a lot of history that pointed towards inflammation patient has not responded to one or two trials of antidepressants patient has raised crp now you might be well within your rights to choose from some of the evidence based options that we have discussed now here is where it gets tricky we cannot make any recommendation as such because there is insufficient evidence for most of these agents but perhaps if you want to choose one agent the maximum evidence is for celecoxib so that maybe you could try uh, for a reasonable duration 
for about three months or something like that before you reevaluate the response and then decide whether to continue it or not. Apart from that, no major recommendations can be given with the uh, available evidence as of now. But it's necessary that each and every one of us keep abreast of this emerging field of anti-inflammatory therapeutics because it's rapidly developing. And uh, perhaps sooner than later, we'll have answers to a lot of questions that we discussed. So that's all I have for you. So to conclude, there is mounting evidence for inflammation in the pathogenesis of uh, depression. Uh, we talked about various mechanistic pathways, how inflammation can drive depression in terms of monoamine pathways, uh, how it can affect glutamate, how it can lead to decreased production of uh, you know, growth factors, certain neuropeptides, how it can activate the HP axis. Some promise has been noted in trials with anti-inflammatory agents, but uh, what has been noted is that as the trials get longer and more methodologically robust, the effect is uh, more and more modest. So that's a little bit of a dampener. But the field is very exciting because it has a lot of scope to give us pointers towards personalized practice of medicine, which is uh, what medicine is moving towards. So the key question at the end is uh, not to ask whether there is inflammation and depression. I think it's fairly clear from whatever we have discussed that there is inflammation and depression. But the key question is, in whom is inflammation relevant? So who, which is that subset of depressed patients in whom inflammation is uh, relevant so that I may use my knowledge of anti-inflammatory therapeutics to guide my day-to-day -day practice? And uh, finally, the future needs in this area are we need to have efficacy and safety of drugs that have less off-target effects. So most of these anti-inflammatory agents that we discussed, even celecoxib, you know, they have a multiplicity of off-target effects. By off-target effects, I mean they not only have effects on anti-inflammatory pathway. You take celecoxib, for example, it has direct effects on glucocorticoid receptors. It has effects on certain synaptic addition molecules like cadrin 11, which... Uh, might be driving some of the clinical benefits that we are seeing. It may not be necessarily that we are observing anti-inflammatory effects of celecoxib, but that may not be primarily due to an action on anti-inflammatory pathways. It may be due to other pathways that have beneficial spin-offs in terms of anti-inflammatory uh, molecules levels. The other is to examine the effect of inflammatory change and related to changes in depressive symptoms, which will provide a much, uh, much more robust uh, evidence of how inflammation may guide treatment uh, variability. And finally, we need to really define a reliable biomarker signature for people with depression in order to identify that at-risk group that may optimally benefit from immune therapies. Uh, these are some of my references. And uh, thank you for a patient listening. This is my email. And these are some images from where I work. I will now stop, share, uh, screen share and hand over back to the moderator. Fantastic is all I can say. Uh, this is what happened.